Welcome back chemists. In this video, we'll be talking about electron configurations or the arrangement of electrons and how it pertains to the type of radiation that we're observing. So we'll first be focusing on electromagnetic radiation, what it is, its characteristics, and its properties. After this video, you should be able to explain the properties of light, calculate the energy wavelength or frequency for a type of electromagnetic radiation, and describe the properties of waves. So my question to you to start off this discussion is what is light? And depending on the properties that you observe, really light can kind of fall under three major definitions. We can describe light as a ray, a wave, and a particle. So we'll first focus on the first definition, light as a ray. And by the end of this unit, we'll be looking at light as a, a wave and a particle. But for right now, let's go back to the ancient Greeks. A ray is said to be a straight line moving from one point to another. And Pythagoras, yes, the right triangle guy, proposed that vision came from light rays coming from a person's eye and focusing on an object. However, the opposite was true for Epicurus. He believed the opposite, that objects produce light rays, which then travel to the eye. There are three well-known phenomena shown to prove light's ray-like tendencies, and they are reflection, refraction, and scattering. And so we'll talk about all of those here. So light as a ray in terms of reflection and scattering, well, light rays will strike smooth surfaces, such as a mirror, and bounce off. So we know that as reflection. And when light strikes a rough surface, like for example, your paper that you're writing on right now, light rays are reflected at many different angles because that surface is uneven. And this is what's called scattering. When we talk about refraction, we're really talking about the ability for light to pass through an object. And this occurs whenever it goes from one, what we say, transparent medium to another. So the medium is obviously the object that it's passing through. And when this happens, light changes speed and the light ray will bend. The angle at which it bends obviously depends on the type of material that it's going through. So let's inspect a little bit light as a wave. So we already talked about light as a ray. So as we move on to light as a wave, we need to talk about James Maxwell. So James Maxwell, around 1860, he defined light as electromagnetic radiation. And usually the abbreviation you'll see is EMR. And this is radiation that we say is made up of electric and magnetic fields. These fields vibrate at right angles to each other. So that is an image that looks kind of similar to describing this. It's a model to help us understand that. And this, I think, would make more sense when you move on to taking um, more like physics classes. But for right now, this is all you really have to know. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. And there's many different versions of this. This is the most simplistic one that I found. And it doesn't have a lot of writing and things on it. So I thought it was pretty good. But you can see towards the right hand side, that's where you have your radio frequencies, um, you've got your microwaves over there, um, and then we move more to the left there, you have your infrared, and then right in the middle there, the visible light is what is actually detectable to the human eye. So that's what we can actually see. You can see it makes up such a small sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then as you move over to UV, X-rays, and gamma rays, these are considered more dangerous types of radiation. So a lot of people say, oh, radiation, it's bad for you. Well, there's different types of radiation. There's what we call ionizing radiation, which is absolutely harmful and can denature your DNA and cause things like cancer. But then there's also non-ionizing radiation, which obviously would fall into the category of radio waves and microwaves. Um, and so it's important to note the difference between the two. Not all radiation is harmful. So now let's talk a little bit about properties of waves. So a wave, we say, is a vibrating disturbance by which energy is transmitted. When we talk about the properties of waves, wavelength is often something we describe. Wavelength has the symbol lambda, kind of looks like an upside down Y. 
It is the distance between identical points on a wave. So for example, one crest to another crest. Frequency has the symbol nu, which looks like a V. And this is the number of waves that would pass through a point in one second. And then amplitude is really the height of the wave from the midline of the wave to the crest or trough. And I'm going to show you in a picture of this just so you can understand what each of these definitions are. A node is what we say a point of zero amplitude. And then here's an image that will hopefully help. So the crest is at the top, the bottom is the trough, notice the wavelength goes from crest to crest, and the amplitude represents the height of the wave. The node is going to be represented right on the um, horizontal line. At any point on that horizontal line where the, the wave is intersecting, that would be considered a node, a point of what we say zero amplitude. That's what a node is. In terms of the speed of waves, we say that electromagnetic radiation travels at the same speed, all of it. As long as it's traveling through a vacuum, this, it's going to travel at the speed of light, C. The speed is related to the wavelength and frequency, although you might have already recognized that. So notice that there is an inverse relationship between the wavelength and the frequency. And I think that makes sense because when we talk about wavelength, if we know that we have a shorter wavelength or a shorter distance between two crests, for example, you're going to have more waves pass through a given section. And so that's why we're going to expect the frequency to increase as a result. So C is always going to be the same number, the speed of light, 2.998 times n to the eighth meters per second. So that's a constant. The lambda there again represents wavelength, and that is typically measured in meters or nanometers. It ju just depends on what the problem is asking you for. And then finally, frequency again has that symbol mu, and this is going to have the symbol uh, reciprocal seconds, right? Like one over seconds or hertz. Both of those are interchangeable. So don't get squirrely if a problem asks for hertz and you're given already those reciprocal seconds. So here's an example of a type of calculation that you would need to perform. What is the frequency of light with a wavelength of 550 nanometers? So the first thing is to identify what formula you're using. So we're obviously going to be using the speed of light equation. And so that 2.998 comes right from the speed of light constant. So that's just something that you need to either memorize or your teacher would give you. The other thing that you need to do is you need to plug in the wavelength. So notice I plugged in 550 nanometers. But if you're looking at this, hopefully you're recognizing that there's something wrong with the units compared to speed of light and wavelength. And so that's why it's incredibly important that you convert the 550 nanometers into meters in order to get those units to cancel out appropriately. So all I did was I um, did my dimensional analysis calculation and I got 5.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Now I can actually safely plug in back into my equation. And when I do that, I have to divide the 5.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters over to the other side. And you should get 5.5 times 10 to the 14th. And then I have per second. You could do 1 over seconds. You could do per second, like I've written there. You could even do hertz. Um, either one is acceptable. So now let's talk about light as a particle and talk about Max Planck. So in the 1900s, he discovered that atoms and molecules emit energy in discrete quantities called quanta. To describe the relationship of this quanta, we focus on the fact that energy equals Planck's constant times its frequency. And so in this case, notice that there is a direct relationship between energy and frequency. As the frequency goes up, the energy goes up. So energy is energy of your vibrating system in joules. The unit is joules, or J. H is a constant, again, similar to the speed of light. That is never going to change. That is always going to be the number that you're going to be using. And then frequency, again, is in reciprocal seconds or hertz. 
So here's an example with this formula. What is the energy of red light if its frequency is 4.567 times 10 to the 14th reciprocal seconds? So again, we know that we're using E equals H nu. And so I plugged in that information. Again, that first number that you see there is called Planck's constant. It's never going to change. And then the second number that you see there is the number that's given in the problem. You can see that the units are appropriate, right? So we've got reciprocal seconds and then we have seconds. So that's good. And so then all we have to do is multiply. And so you should end up with an energy of 3.026 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Don't forget those sig figs. Both of these numbers technically have four sig figs. So that's why my coefficient there has four sig figs. So again, just to um, re-emphasize the important relationships between what we're seeing, right? Based on these formulas that incorporate energy, frequency, and wavelength, we know that energy and frequency are directly related. And when we look at the wavelength and the frequency, we know that these two are indirectly related. So if you have questions, you're definitely going to want to check in with your teacher. You're going to have some practice on performing these calculations. Make sure you share your work, use great sig figs, and include all units. Thank you so much for watching, chemists.